listening to Cherishing Scripture Podcast, a podcast that's changing society by cherishing Scripture. Why do you need to carry an amulet around in your pocket that says WWJD to remind you what Jesus would do? Isn't that the Holy Spirit's job? But it seems like a lot of men are trying to manufacture this difference as opposed to letting it naturally happen. Exactly. And the, exactly Bible, right. the Bible naturally changes people and makes them different. In debates, when you get in a debate with someone, you know that you've won the debate when they turn personal. Yeah. They're attacking these preachers that are standing for their liberty. And right. when they can't find anything biblically wrong with this person, they start picking out other things. Yeah. And if you don't think that those two things can overpower and overtake you, you're pretending. Right. And now here's your hosts, Pastor Brad Bailey, Adam Capps, Zach Taylor, and Jeremy Boggs. Welcome back to Cherishing Scripture Podcast. My name is Adam. This is Jeremy. And this is Pastor Brad Bailey. And uh, we've got our help back. That's Jay behind the uh, camera on the sound. That's Jay with an X. He's helped me. And uh, X. yeah, today we're going to be talking about um, the. <laughs> today we're going to be talking about the hey. Beatitudes again. We're going to be talking about. Um, uh, we titled it "Characteristics of Kingdom Citizens." Kingdom citizens. Yes. Characteristics of Kingdom Citizens. It's a great. It's a great title. But before we do that, we have a segment we're going to do. Uh, we started this last week. Uh, we started talking about toxic tweets. Toxic. It's. It was great. It was an awesome time that we all took apart to talk about a tweet that we all think is somewhat toxic. So we're going to do that again. Um, Jeremy, you got that toxic tweet? Yeah, I got it. Let's hear it. So Let's get this over with. This is going to be a tough <laughs> yeah. one. You ready? Here we go. Put your masks on. <clears throat> if you want to be a Christian, this is what the tweet says. If you want to be a Christian, then follow Christ. Don't follow the Bible. Don't follow preachers. Don't follow your faith traditions. Don't follow theology. Don't even follow Christianity. If you want to be a Christian, take a deep breath and just follow Christ. Uh, Jeremy, that, that's not what it says. Give me that. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what it says. Yeah, that's what it says. Oh, somebody tweeted that. Yeah, it's a real tweet. <laughs> oh, so man. there's a lot of problems. A lot of do problems you, here. Okay. All right. Just starting with the basics here. How do you know about Christ if it's not for the with the Bible? Mm. Like I, I learned about Christ from the Bible, you know. Like, who are you learning it from? Because if you're imagination, I guess yeah. so. I mean, I, I. How do you yeah. know how to live like Christ without the Bible? That, that is another really great point. I mean, if you're if you're come, if you're making up Christ in your own imagination, well, that's something that you made up. So that's you. And that's your policies. Mm-hmm. It, it, I'm not understanding what the point this person is trying to make. Uh, the other two, right after that. Uh, I can kind of maybe possibly see. Don't follow the preachers. Don't follow your faith traditions. Uh, no, I don't. I don't follow my preacher. My preacher and I follow the same thing. Yeah, we follow the teachings of Scripture, and so most of the time we find that we don't disagree on anything. And it's not because I don't like disagreeing. I do like disagreeing on purpose all the time. It's actually rather annoying. <laughs> but it's a but we don't. Gift. <laughs> it's my spiritual gift. But we don't often disagree on things you're a, you're because. A, we are we both have the same guiding principles. You're a yeah. disagreeable person. Yeah. I am a disagreeable person sometimes. But, you know, from the standpoint of what we've been talking about before in the past, you know, if the obviously if the pastor is preaching like yeah, toxic traditions as Pastor Bailey's books is titled, uh, Those are you know, great things titles. like that, you know, I I get why you wouldn't want to follow a pastor there, but even then, you know, like you said, Adam, you you know, you we agree with Pastor Bailey, so we, in some way, do follow his leadership. I mean, yeah. I do follow. So, so here's the that that there is leadership to be followed, right? Because the position of being an elder in a church is a p- position of leadership. You can't forget he was placed there by God. Right. There, there is leadership that is assigned to the position that he's in, but that leadership, like every leadership p- position of leadership, has limits. Mm-hmm. And and I don't follow Pastor Bailey blindly in every single thing that I do. Right. But when it comes to things that are well within the realm of his leadership, of course I'm going to because that's right. Because the guiding principles tells me to. Yeah. He is a shepherd of a flock. The flock is the church. Mm-hmm. He is the shepherd of that flock. The head of the church is Christ, and that's right. not going to change. That's right. not going to be a question. That's not going to be an argument that he or I are ever going to have. 
the head of the church is not Pastor Bailey. The head of the church is Christ. Right. And so we will disagree very little. Right, and that's how you know that you have a good pastor. He doesn't get up on the pulpit and suggest an idea or a tradition or, or whatever and say, this is what I think we should do. You know, he says, this is what the Bible says about this, and then that's why... So. That's I guess that's my thing is like he doesn't in a way if it's not a, if you have a preacher who does that right he says this look this is what the Bible says this is why we should be doing it yeah then that's worth in some case I guess following a, a preacher yeah. absolutely man you know I mean it's it's difficult because it's so easy for a man to let ego get involved when he's in a in a leadership position. And that's for any man in a leadership position. As a father, it is so easy for me to let my... We were just discussing how one of my kids likes to do this thing where he questions literally everything I do. Everything. And it's great because that's exactly the way that I am. But I could very easily let my ego get involved and tell him, you know what, son? I'm doing this because I'm dad. And that's it. That's the reason. You know, sometimes I do say that. And it... I don't know if necessarily it is ego, but I could let it become very egotistical. Like you don't question what I do Mm -hmm. because I'm dad. Well, that's just not right for me to do. Yeah. But it is every leadership position can easily lead into being egotistical. And pastor is not an exception. Yeah. Pastor. So what about this other one? Don't follow theology. I don't know what theology is as something to follow. Yeah. You know, I mean, essentially what this person is suggesting is, um, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm just not a fan of organized religion. This is the age-old argument. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm just not a fan of organized religion. And, and what they're saying is they don't want the accountability of a local church or a system of theological teaching. And uh, theology is basically the study of the study of God, study of God's word. And they would prefer to have sort of a wild west idea of I can believe anything that I can imagine or anything I want. Um, you know, this is this is what I've come to call the Marvel comic Christians, mm-hmm. where, you know, basically anything that you can imagine and you can put pen to paper and draw it, um, that's what they think Jesus actually is. It's the same reason that open out of the closet homosexuals say, well, Jesus loves me too. You know, or Jesus, uh, you know, I'm a Christian also. And the reason it is is because they're imagining another Jesus. And the Bible says that that happens a lot. The Apostle Paul, who, by the way, you guys, excellent content on what you guys were saying. I, I think Paul would have summed that whole thing up by saying, be, be followers of me, even as I also am follower of Christ. Right. So you're exactly right. It's not that you're following Paul. It's just that you are both following the same person, yeah. and God has allowed him to be the leader of the of the pack. Um, but when, uh, you know, I remember one time uh, talking to a guy um and uh, you know he was talking about opening a liquor store in our county, and uh, um, you know, and and I, I kind of engaged with him on that, you know. I, and I'm not I'm not a I'm not normally that type of person who engages someone, but once in a while the the door just swings wide open, and so I engaged this guy on the alcohol issue. And as I began to talk to him about it, I I just got bold with him, and I said, "Brother, look, alcohol is one of the most condemnable things that sends people to hell." And, uh, and he made the statement. He said, well, hey, man, bring it on. If that's what hell is, I'm excited about it. And I said, no, no, I'm not talking about the hell that you're imagining in your mind. I'm talking about the hell of the Bible. And the Jesus of the Bible is a real person with a real agenda, with a real system of theology. He is the logos. He's the written word. And, and the, the, the word logos actually is where we get our word logic from. He is the most sensible person. And, you know, so for them to imagine him being something else is kind of pie in the sky type thing, yep. uh, pipe dream type thing. And, uh, you know, it's sad that there are people out there like this. A lot of them have been church hurt, and that's mm-hmm. really too bad. Yeah. Uh, they, they've been burned by some church or some pastor and or some denomination. And I totally get that. I have too. Uh, I've been down that road for sure. And so uh, I understand why you may be bitter, but uh, you're – Bitterness is allowing you to dispose of all of your reason and your rationality and your spiritual insights, and you're starting to sound like a mystic. And so you, you would want to—I would just suggest to this person, whoever that is—you would want to be careful, um, you know, trying to counsel others on Twitter on how to follow a mythical, imagined Jesus uh, instead of the Jesus of the Bible. 
Well, out of all those yep. that are on that list, I, there's just no way you can actually follow Christ without the Bible. No. That's exactly right. You just right. cannot. That's exactly I'm right. I'm sorry. No, I agree. So, Well, um, whew, that's over with now. We yeah. got it, guys. We, we, we can take our masks off now. We can breathe. Yeah, we're good. Toxic! We're good. <laughs> now let's get to the real reason we're here. Yep. The real reason we're here Matthew is to... Five, nine. That's right. It's to talk about the Beatitudes, to talk about the characteristics of kingdom citizens, which we're all going to be... Well, yeah, we, we'll probably all be there. We're all going to be citizens of the kingdom. I thought we were questioning Jay, not me. No, I was looking right at you. Oh. Yeah, Jay's the one on probation. <laughs> Jay and I are both, both going to be neighbors, sort of going to be in the hood, but we'll build the neighbors. <laughs> My mansion is a one-story. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> going to have himself a shack. <laughs> yeah. That works. Anyway, so let's let's get back to it. Last week was about being pure in heart, and that was a great, great episode. I strongly advise you go back, and the one before that one was super yeah. good too. You really, this whole series is turning out to be an absolute banger. You guys should definitely go listen to all of them. Today, today we are going to talk about something that Adam is terrible at: mm. being a peacemaker. Yeah. It says, "Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God." Who? All right. So, I want to get into being. How does that make you um, a person who is called the child, children of God? Mm. Um, but I suppose we should just stick with definitions to begin with, and then we'll go into the full meaning. So, what, Jeremy, is a peacemaker? Uh, well, I mean, a- according to the Greek one here, it does mean peaceable, or. Um I'm not even going to attempt to say that because I know I'm going to butcher it, even though I know what it says in my head, but I'm not going to read it out loud. <laughs> but it's like a pacifying, isn't it? Being a um, yeah, pacificatory. pacificatory. Pacificatory? Yeah. Yeah. Pacificatory. Like being passive, right? Yeah. So um, that is... A pacifist. Yeah. Right. The, but not a, a modern culture pacifist. Right. It's not talking about that. When I read this verse, I think there's something to be extra careful with. And if you guys think I'm wrong, um, definitely correct me. Okay. This is not saying that you being the peacemaker with God. Because you you are not the peacemaker with God. You don't yeah. make peace with God. That's no. what Christ does. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus Christ is the one is the who one. makes peace with the right. Prince of Peace. Yeah. He was the one that brought the yeah, peace he's between. the Prince of Peace. That's exactly, right. Exactly. The Prince of Peace. He brought the peace between God and and, and us. Okay, so who are we making peace between then? Good question. Yeah. Preacher? Yeah, so there. this this culture in Matthew chapter 5 that they were living in was such a war-torn culture. Um, if you know anything about the history of Jerusalem, the, the name Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it actually means city of peace, but it never was. Still isn't today. It's the most, um, it is the most uh, debated territory in the world. The Muslims want their slice of the pie. The Christians want their slice of the pie. The, um, uh, of course, the, you have the Jews there. You have the Palestinians. Everybody wants their slice of the pie. So the, this culture in which Jesus spoke these words had no idea what a peacemaker was. And he had actually brought two sworn opponents onto his ministry team. Uh, One of them was Matthew Levi, the publican, who had betrayed his people to gather taxes for the Romans. And he could could do any level of markup he wanted to, and he was exploiting Jewish citizens. He was an IRS agent. Yeah, he's basically the Internal Revenue Service of the day. Without a gun. Yeah. He taxed axles. He taxed roads. He taxed animals. He taxed everything. So Jesus chooses him, and he calls Matthew Levi, the publican, and he says, I want you to follow me. And Matthew leaves his tax gathering booth and immediately follows Jesus. Well, there was a group of assassins back in those days who had been assigned to kill Roman soldiers and tax gatherers, publicans, um, senators, and so on and so forth. And they were the, they were called the zealots. And that's where we get the term Simon Zelotes. He was actually one of those, one of those um, uh, assassins. And Jesus called him onto the ministry team too. So we wow. have an ex- at least an example there of what a peacemaker is. Jesus can take a person who is a sworn opponent of someone who 
def, who just absolutely despises the other party. When he saves their soul, they have a common Savior, and that's what brings uh, that's what brings that peace. And I remember so, when I was in law enforcement years ago, I was tell you this really really fast story. We had this guy that got hurt in a wreck, and he was unconscious, and we transported him to the uh, or the EMTs transported him to the. Uh, to the local emergency room, and we followed. And when we got there, there was still some investigative questions we had to do because of the accident. When we got there, they had disrobed this man. You know, they they take the scissors and cut off his shirt and uh, so on and so forth. And they're looking for injuries and where he's bleeding from. And and he had there brandished on his uh, on his pectoral muscle here. He had the uh, the unmistakable tattoo of the of the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, and as soon as we saw that, our eyes all went to this nurse who was taking care of him, who was um, a, a little black lady, a very, very sweet, very attractive little black lady who was taking care of this man. And I thought to myself, you know, how could there ever be peace in this room? Here's a woman who's been commissioned to take care of this man who is a tattooed, branded KKK member, still unconscious. And when he awoke out of his, um, out of his situation, um, and saw, you know, that that tattoo had been exposed. Um, uh, later, this this little black nurse came in, and and he said, "I guess you see, you know, what's here." And and he said, "I want you to know that that was a long, long time ago, and since then I've become a born again believer. And I want you to know that um, uh, I have nothing but respect and love in my heart for every race of people, including." black folks and I just want to thank you for whatever you did for me while I was unconscious to keep me alive Mm -hmm. and so it's amazing how the sword of the Lord can in some cases bring peace but in other cases it brings conflict so Um, Jesus is not saying here that we're supposed to be hippies he's not saying here we're supposed to have peace at any cost because there are occasions where peace is forbidden peace at any cost is not peace at all no exactly right Exactly right, um, but the second half of the verse, and I don't, want to, I don't want to just ramble on again here, but the second half of the verse, for they shall be called the children of God, is just a Hebraism that basically means you resemble your father. So it's not saying you're a child of God, you are born again Christian because you're a peacemaker. That's not what it means. It means you resemble God when you're a peacemaker because God is the ultimate peace giver, the ultimate peacemaker. Uh, you read all the way fast forwarding to the book of Revelation, and there's the fruit of the tree that you eat, and it's for the healing of the nations, which is basically talking about bringing peace among people who uh, obviously never could have any peace. Mm. So <clears throat> I've got like three questions in my head for this. Okay. Um, I don't have to do them all at one time, but I'll do one. <clears throat> so you mentioned, you know, about this fellow that got in this wreck, right? About like the peace between like. How could there be peace between the races and stuff like that? Well, the Jewish were extremely, incredibly racist people. Very much so. Um, and actually, during this time, if I'm not mistaken, the issues with um, um, what was the woman at the well? Yeah, the Samaritan. Yeah, she was a Samaritan. Samaritan. Yeah, right. There, that yeah. that was a, there was still a huge conflict, which because, was even worse because she was she was what would be considered a mixed breed, half right. Jew. So. Yeah. Did he kind of say this in a way to say, "Hey, guess what? You got to make peace with them." That's yeah. a really, really good argument right there. Yeah. Well, you know, the disciples wouldn't go there, right? He went there by himself, and the disciples took a a break from the trip and went and a, a route that actually they went around their elbow to get to their, you know, uh, to their destination, mm-hmm. uh, way, way off uh, out of the way because they did not want to be. They didn't want the dust of Samaria on their feet. Yeah. You don't want anybody near with them. So this is like a, if if it is that way, then this is kind of like a little sneak peek into the, the Gentiles being a part of God's covenant, maybe? Yeah, I think so. And that uh, that came in the person of the Apostle Paul, didn't it? Yeah, and Ephesians. Who was the ultimate war, uh, the ultimate warrior. He was the ultimate, uh, he was the ultimate assassin, the ultimate persecutor, the ultimate... Uh, uh, antagonist uh, against the church and then he was brought to his knees by the spirit of God on the road to Damascus and he became a peacemaker big yeah. time I mean in the church of Corinth he you know there was yeah. some conflicts there yeah. and uh, the church at Corinth was a multiracial cosmopolitan church 
mm-hmm. and Paul. And, you know, the apostle Peter said, now, wait a minute, there's some Jews that should have higher standing than some of these Gentiles that you're bringing into the family. And Paul, you talk about peace under uh, under any circumstance. Paul wouldn't have any of that. He rebuked Peter to him mm-hmm. in his face, and he said, you cannot say that that is the gospel. Yeah, And, and uh, by doing the, that, he brought about peace. So that's kind finally, of the point being right there. Right, yeah. unification and peace right. And, right. and Paul's inclusiveness. Exactly I have a question, right. though. Yeah. Okay. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Yeah. Who? is going to call them the children of God. Yeah. It's a good question. So, which is my way term, of saying I don't know. <laughs> the term Christian that was coined by non-believers. Right. Mm-hmm. We call ourselves Christian now, right? Because it's stuck and it's a great name and we're yeah. all on board with that. We can carry around the name of Christ with us by saying we're Christians. We basically are saying we're believers in Jesus Christ by saying we're Christians. Right. So, are these non-believers, are these the Gentile, are these the heathen calling us, saying they recognize in us the attributes of God the Father? Or is it, or is it God telling us, you are my child? Yeah. Who knows? I don't know, man. It's, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a reputation thing. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know when I see the Caps kids, I, I know them immediately. I mean, yeah. they're the children of Caps the Caps. You know those are Caps kids. Yeah, you know they are, <laughs> and uh, um, you know, and so they're they're, 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 and and there used to be old, you know, way little cliche ways. You know, people would say, "Well, you know, he is definitely his father's child." Mm-hmm. Um, the apple didn't even bounce. Right, it just <laughs> fell straight down and landed by the tree. So, uh, I got another question. Then, yeah, I'm trying to figure out which one I want to ask first. The other one's kind of like a two-parter way. But does this include, does being a peacemaker includes, include being a compromiser in some situations? Jeremy's just trying to make people mad. No, I'm being, That's what I'm being dead serious. Is In <laughs> order to be a peacemaker, is there angry. some level of compromising? You know what, man? <laughs> Listen. I want to shoot myself in the foot here. We might as well all go down together. <laughs> You look at the scripture, man. I'm telling you, the 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 concept of compromise, yeah, in certain contexts, is not condemned in scripture. You know, right. especially in the situation with Daniel, he knew when to compromise. He knew when to compromise, and he knew when to stand up. And so there are occasions when compromise is beneficial. Um, you remember that Jesus talked about uh, going into a city where you will not be received. He said, "Don't stay there and let them murder you." Don't stay there and let them defame you. Don't stay there and let them lie and trump up lies about you and so on and so forth. He said, just shake off the dust of your feet, live to fight another day, go to another city. And so on occasion, compromise is permitted in Scripture if it is um, if it is not yellow. Uh, sometimes silence is fear. golden and sometimes silence is just plain yellow. It's just fearful timidity. Hmm. And that's you not... You know the difference. Yeah. And, and I know when peacemaking... Is for the purpose of just smoothing over, uh, you know, putting a band aid on a surgical wound. I know when there's peacemakers like that, and then I know when there's peacemakers who are genuinely seeking the unity that is given to us in Christ. Mm-hmm. Okay, that was the loaded one. The next one kind of bounces, I guess, a little bit off that. So, does being a peacemaker <clears throat> include forgiveness and or being the bigger person? It's always going to include that. Yeah. I mean, because if you're being a peacemaker between you and somebody else, that is. Mm-hmm. Being a peacemaker between other people requires a certain amount of courage. But being a peacemaker between you and somebody else requires personal courage, right? Not like I'm going out of my way to help somebody else, but I have to overcome something in myself in order to make peace. Right. That is the ultimate kind of peacemaking because it's harder to do. So if you two are fighting here, it takes a, a certain amount of courage and care to make sure you guys are okay, you know, to help out there. But if you and I are fighting, well, now it's personal. Now yeah. it's me. Mm-hmm. And whatever is being fought about hurts me. So the amount of courage and care that it takes is significantly higher. Mm-hmm. So I think that that was actually a, a really good point to bring up because if you can make peace with somebody else, mm-hmm. humbling yourself, taking wrong, you know, being wronged by somebody and having meekness and still looking to make peace regardless of right. how you've been hurt, that is strength, that yeah. is courage, and I that agree. is peacemaking. And I that agree. is expressing the reality of who God is. 
because we wronged him. Mm -hmm. We wronged him more than you will yep. ever be right. wronged in your entire life. Mm -hmm. We've wronged him worse than that. Sure. But he has gone out of his way to make a way for you to be right with him, That's to right. make a way for you to have peace with him. So if we're going to resemble him and be called the children of God, yeah. how, what what better way than to, than to make peace with somebody who's got issue with you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this verse from an antithesis standpoint, what's the what's the antonym or the opposite of a peacemaker? It's an antagonist. Feet that are swift to running to mischief. No, yeah. that's not it. What is it? Yeah. Feet that be swift to running to mischief. Yeah, or that you one. could also say a lying tongue. Yeah. And you could also add, uh, what's the one about a... He that soweth discord. Soweth discord that's among the, the brethren. Okay, yep. so that discord that's discord the opposite. The yep. That's the opposite of a peacemaker. If you know what those things are, mm -hmm. then you have a, a pretty good head start on what a peacemaker actually is. So yep. if we if we inserted here the antonym to peacemaker and we included those descriptions, there also needs to be an antonym to they shall be called the children of God. They're sons of Belial. They're sons of Belial. That's exactly it. right. Naughty. And so yeah. uh, yeah, a person Belial. who is a peacemaker resembles his father in heaven, a person who is an antagonist, a gossip, feet, a feet that run to mischief and so on and so forth, they are the children of Belial. They resemble their father, the devil, because this is exactly what Satan does and looks like, is he brings division and not peace. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about antithesis, again, with the pure in heart, the antithesis of that was the Pharisees. Well, the antithesis of this is the Pharisees too. Yep. The Pharisees brought exactly zero peace to anybody. It was yep. conflict constantly. They dragged that woman out to yep. Jesus in order to make conflict, right? Right. So, I mean, everything with them, they were they went at Jesus in order to make conflict. They wanted and, to drive people away from him. They wanted people to argue with him. Yeah, and 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 the interestingly, they actually the, accused him of being the devil. They did, yes, yes, they did. And the Pharisees and Sadducees hated each other until they found a common enemy in Jesus, and then they started loving each mm. other out of convenience just long enough to get him crucified. And exactly, what was the end of their work? Right. Violence. Right. Some of the worst, the worst violence that this earth has ever seen. That Absolutely. was the end of what their plan was. Mm -hmm. That's what they wanted all along. And they lied and they schemed to get there. Yep. And they got there. They got what they wanted. There was not peace. Yep. Hmm. That's a great verse, man. Yeah, it is. That great was awesome. Sermon. The yeah. masterpiece of Jesus. The wonderful sermon. Yeah. He is the Prince of Peace. That's yep. right. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and transition to a different segment now. We've covered that pretty well. Yeah, I think so. Um, we're going to go to questions. You guys should absolutely be posting questions. I'm on YouTube. There's Spotify. Can you post questions? You probably can't post questions on Spotify. No, I you can, can tweet you it. You can answer questions. You can answer questions. Yeah. So um, you, there's Twitter, mm -hmm. um, and then there's um, on, on our you own can actual email website. it to. What, what is our email? Uh, I don't know if we have one for that. You can send email. it to the church email, info at brandonbaptisttabernacle.com. There you go. If you wanted to, you can send it to that. Info, info at Brandon. You're going to have to put that up there. Info man. at brandonbaptisttabernacle.com. Our, our, um, our website has a spot for you to ask. Okay. So yes. you can leave an actual like voicemail. Cherishingscripturepodcast.com. Yep. Or actually type one to us. Yes, absolutely. So definitely post questions as many as we get. We're going to go through them because... It's fun. We really appreciate questions and being able to talk about it. So, Jeremy, what's our question? Uh, the question is, in how many ways do you think men hear God's voice, uh, and do you think God speaks every day? So, Great question. That's a two-parter. Uh, if you guys, I'm going to say the only one way that I know that God speaks, okay? And um, you guys tell me if there are other ways, but I think the only one way that God truly speaks is, it's through right here. I think to answer that question properly, mm -hmm. one has to discuss all of the ways in which God has ever spoken to humans to kind of round out how special the Bible is mm -hmm. for us. Pastor, do you want to do that? I feel like that's something that you yeah, be you know, at. I, I am, you know, I probably am and a little a little too analytical on some of these things. I, I've thought about this. Uh, I read a book several years ago. Uh, and and actually did a series of messages after reading this little book on Hear Him Speak. That was the series, and it's probably uh, 15, 18 years ago. I don't know. And um, I think that there are layers of, of methods that God can use to speak to people. I agree 100% with Jeremy and with you, Adam. I think that the primary in the church age, when that which is perfect has come, which I believe is the Word of God, I think the 
primary way, preferable way that God speaks is through the written word. So I want to say for alliteration purposes, he speaks primarily through the scripture. I would also add that he speaks secondarily through a sermon from the scripture. And if you have a an expositor as a pastor, uh, you can go and listen to that pastor preach and hear him basically speaking on behalf of God if he's representing it right. Mm-hmm. That's God's message to you. Um, third, and this may come as a surprise to some people, but I think it's a it's the scripture. It's a sermon from the scripture, and then third and less preferable, um, it has to be the uh, the spirit of God. Uh, you don't want to walk around with this ethereal experience all the time, where you're saying, "Spirit of God, speak to me." Spirit of God, speak to me. Spirit of God, speak to me. Because you really open yourself yourself up to other spirits and, and your own bad thoughts. teachings and bad bad a bad word and so well but that's why we I don't know that's why we have the bible yeah we do because if if what the spirit is telling you in your heart um is coming in contradict with the word of god then then you know that that's not right it, exactly and right. also a believer should be able to recognize the voice of his, his of his you know the shepherd sure. right the sheep should be able to recognize the voice of the shepherd right sure. so when the spirit of god speaks to a person you should know yeah and if you don't know well then yeah, there's there's some things to work out yeah i don't know i i i wouldn't i wouldn't go as far to say that it's less preferable yeah. however if you are if you are more on the one than the other um, it would be better to be more on the scripture than on the spirit. Yeah. Because the scripture is, is not, well, it's the sword of the spirit. Mm-hmm. Th- yeah. That is exactly, that's exactly it. So like when you were saying, you know, through the sermon of the preacher, well, the sermon of the preacher is things that he has He's learned from the, the Bible. Oh, God. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So it all comes back to the Bible. Like you, you will be told things by the spirit if you are a believer. And if those, those things will never come and be, will never be contradictory exactly to right. what's found in the word of God. Yeah. That's correct. So it all comes back to the Word of God. But Correct. yes, I, I do believe that people um, have the Spirit of God in them, and that Spirit of God can talk to you, and you should be sensitive to it and know that it's Him when He talks to you. Mm-hmm. And there have been occasions in my in my, um, in my my Christian life, 37 years now, having been a Christian, there have been occasions where I, when I know that I was being led by the Spirit to do a certain thing or to, you know, I've always given this outline. The spirit of God teaches us where to go, what to give and who to glorify. Those are the the basics of pneumatology. He tells us where to go. Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to pray. So on and so forth. The spirit led Paul to Antioch. So on and so forth. Uh, He tells us where to go. He tells us what to give. Spiritual motivation and giving is, is an essential. He tells us who to glorify. The spirit of God is always going to point us in our doxology to the person of Jesus Christ or to the Father. And uh, so the Spirit is a reliable source, but I'm just suspicious about some people's claim of the Spirit they're listening to. I'm okay, wondering that, if they are listening to the same Spirit that would confirm every well, I would word say that, of the 1189 chapters of the Bible yeah. or if the Spirit is telling them to do something. Uh, that is that is way from from way out on left field because they don't want to read the Bible. Yeah, that is a very good point. That voice that we say is going to be the Spirit's voice. That voice will never contraindicate what the Scripture says. That's exactly. Right. And and something else that it will never do is it will never tell me about what Jeremy should be doing. Exactly right. That's not something yeah, that the it Holy does. Ghost told me to tell you. Yeah. No, uh, you can forget that. That, that, does that doesn't work happen. here. Now, yeah. Here's the question: Do you guys think God can still use a dream? Of course, He can. Do you think he does? I don't know. I think he does. Hey, you know what? Maybe it's just me. Maybe I've not had a dream. Actually, yeah, I think I might have had one. But um, you know, people are different. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit spoke, can speak in dreams, and has spoken in dreams, and and the way the Holy Spirit speaks to certain people is different. I know that because I've recognized that. Yeah, I've had friends where where it is obvious to me that they are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. No. Yeah, and well, now, and what I mean by like the dreams, like I don't mean again back to like you said the things that are for you, right? Because one way dreams are used in the Old Testament was to communicate for other people, like the dreams that the those kings had that like Daniel would go and interpret. You know, those were for um, 
I guess necessarily for I guess him, but it was also for the, the future timeline of like the statue, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's there was dreams or like dreams that were affected for that was effect that was going to be for the whole for whole entire Egypt when Joseph interpreted the dream of Pharaoh when he said there's going to be famine in the land and stuff like that that taught the people how to prepare. Yeah, those are those are prophetic though. Yeah. Um. So, but what I mean a, is like as far as using a dream to like specifically for you. Yeah. I well, uh, if you're going to cite not. those. Those Old Testament dreams had to have an interpretation. Yeah, and it's kind of the same way in the New Testament with this, with the uh, the gift of tongues. If there's no interpreter, it's invalidated. Mm-hmm. And so, if you can't give a solid biblically based interpretation of a dream, I think it's invalid. Yeah. So the second part of that question was, Does, um, how many times a day do you think he speaks? God, God should. I, I believe. I believe that God should be speaking to you all the time because you should be speaking to him all the yeah, time. I pray without ceasing. Right, so exactly. So the people that pray without ceasing are the people that see God, that hear God all the time. You mm-hmm. see God work and you you hear him speak to you through the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. It, and the people who don't pray, that that pray on Wednesday yeah. when they come to church and maybe when they eat their food occasionally right. two or three times a day. Um, those people are not going to be hearing God every day. They're not going to be listening. It's not mm-hmm. listening. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, if we talk about back to the this the Bible being the primary source that he uses the, as the top, you know, I would also that's say true. how many times you open that book a day. That's that's exactly right. You have to know this book. You have to hide it in your heart if you're going to be able to know the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. is speaking to you. Because if you don't know the Bible. Then when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it'll I mean not with the Holy Spirit, when you feel like something inside of you, you're gonna claim it's the Holy Spirit, but it, it's contradictory to the Bible, right. but you don't know. Dangerous. Please Very dangerous. I'm just gonna pop in on this one. Uh, Psalm nineteen one, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's exactly right. Mm. So the very creation is a, a message from God. And it's a message of God constantly, so you can hear God just by yeah. walking outside. And it break, you know, what's amazing about that is is the heavens that declare the glory of God. That, that breaks that. all language barriers, all yeah. racial barriers. That's everybody, what it says. Everybody no has access to the heavens. It's not her. Yeah, it's good. Well, I think that pretty much answers the question. It's a great question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I'm excited for the question that we're going to answer next time on Cherishing Scripture Podcast. You guys can hear us on Spotify. You can hear us on YouTube. You can hear us on our website, Cherish Scripture Podcast. We're on Google Play, Apple, whatever that is. Um, and uh, what else are we on? There's like eight platforms that you can choose from. There's a bunch. Chances are we're on yours. Yeah. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, we'll see you next time on Cherishing Scripture Podcast. Yeah.